this will in no way be controversial. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Robertson, and in between making chemistry-based videos, I like to answer your questions from the comments. And this one comes from Kyushu University Foreign Students Association. It says, is nuclear power good or bad? Well, we instantly run into a problem there because nothing is simply good or bad, even air. Air contains oxygen, which is so reactive that it damages your body and breaks up your DNA, which means it's directly responsible for things like heart attacks and cancer. But of course we can't live without it. In other words, despite the problems of oxygen, the benefits outweigh the costs. Now, before we go on, I should point out that I am not a nuclear engineer and I am not an expert in energy policy but I am a scientist who's been following this topic for over 20 years, which means that my opinion is based on the scientific facts of the matter. Also, I live close to a nuclear power station, which is built on an earthquake fault, so I am very much exposed to the risks. As for benefits, I certainly do not get so much as a penny from the nuclear power industry, either directly or indirectly. Now, first, let's look at the immediate benefits of nuclear power. Nuclear fuel is incredibly energy dense, which means we only need a small amount of it to generate large amounts of energy, which makes extracting the fuel so much easier and also means we will not run out of energy for hundreds of thousands of years. Crucially too, it reduces a country's dependence on oil. So a country can also become more energy independent. So whoopee do, let's all go full in for nuclear power. Well, that clearly hasn't happened, so why not? Well, the problem is that nuclear power has got two big problems. And in this talk, I'm going to distinguish between engineering problems and fundamental problems. An engineering problem is a problem that can be fixed with enough time and money, whereas a fundamental problem cannot be fixed. Now, the first problem, which is a fundamental problem, is that nuclear power generates large amounts of radioactive waste, which is highly toxic. And that leads directly to the second problem, which is an engineering problem, which is that it is extremely expensive to handle and dispose of all of that radioactive waste. So how do we weigh up these benefits and costs? Well, we make a rational and factual analysis of a country's energy needs. We look at the resources it has. We look at the benefits and the costs of the various mixes of energy. And actually, we don't do any of that. We do politics, which is a short way of saying we do lots of shouting. But the groups that are shouting the most loudly are the groups that benefit from it the most. That means the nuclear power industry, obviously, but also the fossil fuel industry who are lobbying against nuclear power and then also from certain environmental groups that have an ideological bias against nuclear power. That leaves the rest of us somewhere in the middle, desperately trying to work out what's really going on. You can do a whole degree on trying to work out how much uh, nuclear power should be part of any energy mix, if at all. But I don't think we need that for this video. The question was, is it good or bad? In other words, do the costs outweigh the benefits? And another way of looking at it is, should we be actively increasing our amount of nuclear power or decreasing it? And I think that question is answerable. And in fact, I think the answer is clear. Let's start with the problem. Nuclear power was supposed to be the wonder energy of the 20th century, and now it isn't. So why is that? The real reason nuclear power has such a bad reputation is because it's too expensive 
to have at home or in our general daily lives. That means it has to be in some far off place that we aren't allowed to just walk in and go and take a look at. Of course, most people probably think it's because it's dangerous. But we're actually quite used to living around dangerous sources of energy. We have gas explosions, we have oil fires, we have lithium batteries now catching fire from people's bicycles, charging up at home or even in their pockets. But we live with that danger because it is familiar to us. We carry it around with us and we don't care. So are the dangers from nuclear power and fossil fuels equivalent? Well, not really. With fossil fuels, we are looking at constant, low level, but widespread toxicity with frequent but small scale disasters, typically killing fewer than 20 people at a time. With nuclear power, we are looking at very rare, but very serious disasters that could be killing somewhere between thousands to tens of thousands of people. In over 60 years of commercial nuclear power, we've had two major disasters. One in Chernobyl in Ukraine in 1986 and another in Fukushima in 2011. In Chernobyl, an old fashioned and dangerous design combined with an unusual set of circumstances to cause one of the reactors to overheat. That overheating pressurized the water past the ability of the steam system to contain it and that led to a water explosion that blew the roof off the top of the reactor building. The extreme heat of the reactor meant that graphite, a form of carbon inside the reactor, caught fire and that fire spewed radioactive material out into the atmosphere. And that toxic material then contaminated much of Northern Europe. To be clear, this was not a nuclear explosion and could never have been. The accident itself killed somewhere between 30 and 50 people with the radioactive cloud going on to kill many more people than that. We'll come to that number later. And furthermore, large areas of land were polluted for years to decades afterwards. In Fukushima, a nuclear power plant was hit by the strongest earthquake in Japan's recorded history. Although the power plant survived the earthquake, it sent two huge tsunami waves over five stories high crashing into the power plant. Now, these waves knocked out the cooling systems, which meant that once again, water overheated, overpressurized, and blew a hole in the containment for the reactor. The extremely high temperatures of these reactors, which were no longer being cooled, meant that water reacted with metal inside the reactors and produced hydrogen gas. And this hydrogen gas exploded, once again blowing the roofs off of the reactors and releasing radioactive material into the environment. And to be clear, once again, this was not a nuclear explosion and could never have been. Now, the accident itself did not kill anyone, but the release of radiation meant that people had to be evacuated from a 30 kilometer radius of the nuclear power plant. And that toxic waste went on to contaminate large areas of farmland. Thousands of people had to be relocated. And it's estimated that over 2000 people died as a result of their stress from this relocation. It is extraordinarily difficult to get reliable numbers of deaths from these accidents. There is simply no easy way to discriminate between people who got cancer as a direct result of radiation from these leaks, from people who got cancer from smoking or just general environmental pollution. And added to that, we have organizations that want to suppress those numbers as low as possible. But on the other hand, 
other organisations who want to inflate those numbers as high as possible. This makes it extremely difficult, even for scientists like me, to find the reliable data. And there are studies which are better than other ones. But certainly a Google search is not going to be enough. With Chernobyl, estimates of deaths range somewhere from thousands to tens of millions depending on who you choose to listen to. And with a variation like that, you cannot simply say, well, it must just be somewhere in the middle. This makes it extremely difficult to assess the true costs and benefits of nuclear power. I remember both accidents, but I followed the Fukushima situation particularly closely because I was here in Japan at the time, and it really influenced my thinking on nuclear power. I followed the news, and particularly expert opinion, several times every day as this disaster was unfolding. But there was so much confusion. Even before the explosions, nobody could go inside the reactor buildings because the aftershocks were so frequent and were major earthquakes in their own right. After the explosions, the radiation inside the buildings was far too high even for robots or drones. So nobody knew for certain what was going on inside there. And it certainly didn't help that the Japanese government was not being completely open. And in fact, that allowed false rumours to flourish. I did my best to find a consensus of expert opinion, which was extremely difficult because those opinions went from it'll be okay all the way over to it'll be a complete disaster. And that's not surprising because literally nobody knew what was really going on inside those buildings. Personally, I veered towards the it'll all be okay side of things. I had confidence that Japanese engineering was some of the best in the world. In the end, things were certainly far worse than they needed to be, but not as bad as many people had claimed they would be, or perhaps as bad as some people had hoped they would be. Back in those days, I was a member of a small online community. It was a sort of mini Reddit. And I read about the Fukushima incident and posted about the Fukushima incident on that uh, community almost every day. There were many trolls, of course, but also a few expert opinions. And also a certain kind of comment that I hadn't been expecting to see. Glee. This was the first time I had come into contact with the anti-nuclear environmental lobby. They almost seemed excited with wild speculations about what was really going on and predictions of millions of deaths. This was their time. I was trying to get some expert opinion, but this community was anonymous, so I could only tell the experts by the way they spoke. But I could tell the anti-nuclear crowd because they loved to refer to nuclear power plants as nukes, as in the slang term for nuclear bombs. For them, the two things were exactly the same, and they loved as much as possible to confuse people about which was which. To be clear, nuclear power and nuclear bombs are as different as a wood fire and a conventional bomb. Stealth bombers don't drop bits of flaming wood, and you wouldn't heat your house with a laser-guided bomb. Well, not for very long anyway. Nuclear power plants are not bombs and never could be. The physics is totally different. The anti-nuclear lobby also like to say things like there's no safe dose of radiation. Really? So they don't eat bananas? Because bananas contain radioactive potassium. Or maybe they don't fly in jets. If you fly in a jet, you get exposed to more gamma rays from space. The fact is, we are subjected to constant, small changes in radiation throughout our lives. The way they talked was a huge clue to me 
that these people could not be trusted. Why were they deliberately confusing the difference between a nuclear power plant and a nuclear bomb? Or why were they scaring people about very small, tiny doses of radiation, which are a part of our natural environment anyway? And the answer is simple. By confusing people like this, they can scare them. And if they scare them, they can get them to oppose nuclear power. And why would they want to do that? Because of Chernobyl? Because of Fukushima? What I found through these discussions was that the anti-nuclear crowd was simply not interested in fact-based discussions. You've probably met people like this. The anti-vaxxers, the fake medicines, the Earth is flat people. The anti-nuclear lobby might have started from opposition to nuclear weapons, but it has morphed to become an ideological movement, to become a community. And they hide under the umbrella of environmentalism because that gives them some legitimacy, right? Protecting the environment can't be wrong, right? But over the following days, weeks and months, things went steadily worse for me. I'd started out as an optimist, but first of all, I discovered that these reactors were old designs that didn't have the safety features of modern reactors. Next, we had the hydrogen explosions that I thought simply wouldn't happen. And then finally, weeks later, we discovered that the Japanese Energy Authority that was responsible for ensuring the safety of nuclear reactors, had discovered that a five-storey tsunami was possible at Fukushima, but they hadn't forced the company operating that nuclear plant to update its safety features. I had always thought that nuclear power was the safest of all generating methods, but now I had to alter that position because of the facts. So what position did I come to? You see, the question isn't as simple as simply having or not having nuclear power. We still need the energy that nuclear power produces. So how are we going to get that energy? Well, renewables. Oh! Unfortunately, renewables come with a big fundamental problem. They simply don't generate enough energy most of the time. If we have enough wind generators and solar panels and whatever for a still winter's night, then we have far too much for a windy, sunny day. And that means a huge waste of energy and materials, much of which cannot be recycled. I've got lots of wind turbines around me right now and most of them aren't turning most of the time. And yes, scientists and engineers are working on ways to store and transmit that energy to where it is needed. But those technologies will not be commercially available for decades yet. And we actually know what happens when you just turn off your nuclear power stations. Because Japan and Germany both did it as a direct result of the Fukushima incident. Well, as a direct result of the anti-nuclear lobby, which went on the march following the Fukushima incident. So, what did happen? Coal. Coal is what happened. You see, coal is cheap, and it's much cheaper, much easier to revive old coal-powered stations than it is to build vast new renewable energy power plants which aren't producing enough energy most of the time. And that literally means coal-powered electric cars and coal-powered trains. The smoke might not be coming out of their exhausts, but it's coming out somewhere and poisoning people. And is that coal smoke killing people? Absolutely. Major cities around the world are cloaked in a choking, toxic dust. They're told to stay at home and not open the windows. Here in Japan, we get black rain full of coal dust from Chinese factories. But at least it's not radiation, right? Well, 
even if radiation were worse than toxic chemicals, there is still plenty of radiation emitted from coal power stations. The ash that's left over contains radioactive uranium and thorium, and it's often just dumped in big heaps somewhere. So coal stations actually emit 200 times more radiation than nuclear power stations do. And that's not nearly the worst of it. Because it's not just coal, is it? If we shut down all the nuclear power stations and we don't build any new ones, and if renewable energy cannot reliably provide us with energy for the next few decades, where are we getting that energy from? Well, there's also oil and gas, methane, isn't there? And just because you can't always see the smoke, it doesn't mean that it's not killing us, perhaps even killing all of us. You know where I'm going with this. Fossil fuels generate huge amounts of carbon dioxide, and that is fueling a climate crisis. Every year we see the hottest month, the longest drought, the strongest hurricane, the largest floods, the worst forest fire on record. We are seeing mass extinctions happening before our eyes. We are seeing huge glaciers melting in Greenland and Antarctica, which are raising sea levels, which combine with these huge storms to kill tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people every year. And that's still not the worst of it. Because these huge droughts, these floods cause massive upheavals in society. People going without food, people going out with water, and that creates social unrest. It creates riots. It creates mass migrations of people. And that leads to wars. We had a war in Syria just a few years ago that started because of a riot over water and ended up with a NATO plane shooting down a Russian warplane. And that's just a taster of what's to come. We need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we are putting into the atmosphere. And renewable energy sources will be the biggest part of that. But until we have mass energy storage, they will not reach their potential. Now that will come sometime over the next few decades, but nuclear power is available now. And even if we suppose that the accidents of the last 60 years of nuclear power are going to be typical of the next 60 years of nuclear power, and I don't think that they will be, Modern reactors are nothing like Chernobyl and Fukushima. That is still far, far less damaging than the next 60 years of carbon dioxide. And I'm speaking as somebody who lives within 20 kilometers of a nuclear power plant. One that's built on an earthquake fault. Now, nuclear power does emit carbon dioxide from the construction of those nuclear power plants and from the processing of the fuel. But those power plants that were shut down for political reasons in Japan and Germany have already paid those costs. They've already made those emissions or they will do in the future. So if by starting them up again, we can have clean electricity without producing any extra carbon dioxide emissions. And as for building new power plants in the future, it is true that we could spend that money on renewable energy instead. But we still have the reliability problem. And nuclear power plants do produce nuclear waste, which is toxic and dangerous. But because nuclear fuel is so energy dense, it is easy to carefully store that nuclear waste deep underground, where we know it won't surface again for millions of years. We simply can't do that with normal fossil fuel waste. As for building new nuclear power plants, well, we could spend the money on renewables, that is true, but we simply can't be sure that we will have the reliability from renewable power plants. We can't be sure that sourcing the materials for renewable power plants will not run into some form of political problem. So any sensible person is going to produce a backup plan. 
one that includes a mix of energy sources. How much nuclear power needs to be part of that mix is certainly a matter of debate, but it needs to be based on rational thinking and facts, not on fear-mongering and politics. So, to answer the question, is nuclear power good or bad? It's neither. But I'm convinced that for the next few decades at least, it's better to have it than not to have it. If you want to know any more about the subjects of this video, I've put a bunch of links down below in the description. I really recommend the 2011 Earthquakes video. It's an animation that plays a little pop with every earthquake that scales according to how big that earthquake was. You have to wait just over a minute to get to the uh, Tohoku earthquake, the big Fukushima earthquake. Um, but I recommend waiting for that time to give you a sense of um, how earthquakes normally are. And if you can't hear the pops, you might want to turn the volume up a little bit. OK, so the comment section is where you get to have your say. I'm sure there will be a whole range of opinions. But whatever your opinion, if you're a rational thinker, remember to stay professional and let's all be polite. Oh, and don't forget to click the like button and why not leave a question for next time? See you then. Oh!